really honored to introduce Jonathan Hurst. Jonathan Hurst, I believe, was a graduate student at CMU when I arrived in 2000. Welcomed me there. After that, we had a, a, a long-term battle where I would say to him, you've got to learn to program, and he would say, why do I need to do that? I'm surrounded by these CS people. They can all work for me, and I'm the only one who can design a robot. And I said, no, you're wrong. Now, many years later, I have to say he was right. <laughs> wow. Well, thank you for that introduction. <laughs> So I am going to talk about not programming things, okay. So uh, there have been a number of talks today about models, like the one we were just, just hearing. Um, but my question is, modeling what, okay? And the point of this talk, I just the one point, the take home message I'll tell you at the beginning is that I believe that there is a dynamical phenomenon that we're trying to discover and understand, and it's sort of a special corner of physics. Um, and I like to compare it to uh, pendular dynamics, okay? Uh, that's kind of a unique thing where the frequency of a pendulum is not sensitive to uh, the amplitude. And it took people a long time to figure that out, but those physics have always, always existed, of course, because it's just, just physics. So someone pointed it out, and then it took another long time for someone to point out, here's a much better you know, description of it that's actually true. Um, and so a simple pendulum, obviously, is not a sufficiently rich model, even though it captured a lot of, a lot of what, uh, what was going on there. And, and I think legged locomotion is like that, too. We have these, these simple models, these simple spring mass models, that really do describe a lot of the features that we see in animals. Um, but they're not a sufficiently rich model to describe all we want in many cases. Sometimes they are, sometimes they're not. Maybe a simpler model for a controller would be, you know, uh, good enough. It, it depends. Um, so, you know, what is a model to describe this dynamical phenomenon? I guess I'm partial to models that really are descriptive of the physics, that really are not um, just uh, uh, descri describing the symptoms, but are actually capturing the physics. Um, you know, I feel like inverted pendulum models capture quite a lot of it for walking, but less so for running. Uh, spring mass models do, but now if you add a little bit of damping and optimal actuation, it gets much, much better, and you see the little tail on each one. Uh, if you start adding a little bit of simple heuristic controls on drop steps, now it's starting to describe a lot more of this dynamical phenomenon. Um, but you might ask the question, why constrain ourselves? If there's this dynamical phenomenon, maybe it's uh, five degrees of freedom or, or six or four, I don't know. Um, why would we be looking for that if you can do anything? Because you have a 47 degree of freedom robot, you have optimizers, you can do anything. I would argue that if you do constrain yourself to this dynamical phenomenon, try to understand it and do the uh, engineering to make it happen, it is robust. Uh, let me run this video. This is a picture of Atreus, our robot, uh, and it has no sensors on it. It has no perception, it has no awareness of its surroundings. In this video, we've just told it to walk forward. We promise there's nothing in your way. Uh, it has no external perception. It has internal encoders and it has an inertial measurement unit, but it has no way of perceiving that there's an obstacle that it's running into. And certainly that toe catching in a weird way is not something that we could prepare for, but it recovers you know, very nicely. And that's just um, dynamical behavior right there. Uh, I feel like Atreus is an example of something that's close, but certainly not capturing the richness of everything we would want. Um, it requires very simple computation. It's a lot lower degree of freedom. It has great energy economy. Um, and I think this dynamical phenomenon, if we figure it out and can define it, can capture all the behaviors seen in animal, animal locomotion. So it's really not actually that restrictive. It actually could make our lives a lot easier. So the next thing we need to do is the engineering to capture the dynamics. Even if we can describe this, OK, like describing pendular dynamics, it was hundreds of years of escapements and you know, creating the human interface with the clock face so you could read it, having it integrate the number of swings and add up the counts to keep track of time and so on. Um, we have to do the same thing with, uh, with, with legged locomotion. Even if we understand it, there's still an awful lot of engineering. Um, with Atreus, we were very careful to measure what were the dynamics. So let's throw this thing in the air and measure it. And we got ground reaction forces that were a really good match with humans. This is Christian Hubicki, by the way, walking over the force plate, and that's Atreus walking over the the force plate. Um, yeah, and I've kind of, this is my camp right here, the passive dynamics and the actuated control. 
engineering, uh, it's about 50-50. Maybe it's 60-40. I don't know. So this is what we're trying to do at, at um, my lab and at my company. The company, Agility Robotics, does uh, really good engineering. Um, the laboratory continues to focus on open questions. If we don't know the answer, you know, that's the place to do research. So this was filmed on Friday. Um, we're making progress. We've got a lot of work still to do. Let's see. I think we've got some video here of it kind of still stepping blind. sideways. It's still blind. There's still no external perception. There's springs right there. You can see that's a fiberglass, the same kind of material used in archery bow. There's another spring inside under the shell right there. Um, there are five degrees of freedom per leg. Uh, yaw, adduction, abduction, um, leg extension. Um, and then there's a little ankle one down there as well. Uh, so the one change in that controller is that the swing leg trajectory is a little bit higher. So we just made the swing leg trajectory a little bit higher um, so it didn't stub its toe quite so easily when it went over things. Is someone controlling the speed? Yeah, so, so Mikhail was there with his controller. And he's, he can give it sideways speed and forward speed and switch between modes. And he's got a dial for the changing the, the ca how it calculates the trajectory for the... Um, lifting the leg up and things like that. Uh, Mikhail doesn't have his eyes closed. But he's not preparing for the stairs. What he might do is, is you know, come up and slow down a little bit and then say, okay, now go, or, so, or something along those lines. But it, it obviously would be a lot better once there's perception on the robot and can actually incorporate some planning. How do you detect contact? Uh, sorry? How do you detect, How do you detect contact? We, we measure the forces we're applying on the ground. Because we've got those springs and we've got very good proprioception throughout the limbs. So there's, there's no electronics below about that point right there. There's no... It's all coming from the joints. It's all coming from the joints. So we're measuring motor currents and we're also measuring spring deflections, but there's no sensors on the feet to measure uh, deflection. Um, and I, I guess another point, I'm not sure if I make it anywhere in this talk, is that if you're going to do footstep planning, you want to go upstairs and things like that, um, you know, you have to plan within the dynamical state space. If we're looking at this dynamical phenomenon, you have to, there's a certain dial or there's some action space. You're maybe changing your stride frequency or your energy injection or something of this cycle that's occurring. Um, you can't calculate a new trajectory because that's going to contradict what your dynamics want. Um, and and uh, we use a uh, simulator a lot to develop this uh, internally to figure out our controllers. And then it's a really fast process to just go from the simulator and put it on the robot. And we've just released that um, so you can download the simulator and, and try it if you want to try some controllers on the robot. It gives you all the state information and, and then you apply motor torques to it. Um, and I brought some little postcards too that have the URL so you don't have to write it up. Please take them. I brought 50. I don't need to take them back. So. Uh, yeah, a after you get the physics, after you say, okay, I, I, I either understand this dynamical phenomenon of leg and locomotion, and I'm implementing it because I have good engineering, or I'm close and I'm capturing 80% at least, and I've done my physics and I understand something about at least an approximated action space that's going to work, then you can do the planning um, for planning over steps and stairs and things like that. And this is, this is, um, maybe an artist's rendering of what the uh, dynamical state space looks like. I don't know. I downloaded that off the Wikipedia page for something. I can't remember now. So, all right, thank you. Okay, questions, yeah. The model that you're using is like just a single mass, right? Uh, for the control or for the motion planning. Um, in your case, it makes sense because I think most of the mass is really in the body and you have lightweight legs. I think this would change if you would have, um, if the legs would be um, heavier or you would create faster movements with the legs and create more, more momentum. Yeah, I mean, you know, take it to an extreme and, and you can't program a rock to fly. So, you know, the way I think of this is that we are trying to create a behavior. We're trying to generate this dynamical phenomenon. And that is 50% machine design, where we put the springs in the right place. We figure out what our antagonistic work is. We figure out how to, you know, uh, 
create the dynamic behavior we want in the machine as a close integration with the low-level controls. So yes, we have to design the machine, the model, the controller, all of that together. You just asked me something more specific. Okay, I missed it then. So if you, for example, would do more crazy movements with the legs, you would yeah. create more momentum. Sure. The simple model that you assume that oh. the signal mass would be wrong at some point. Yeah. So you're saying if I want to get up to doing a really hard sprint, yes. now when I try and swing my leg, then the, the thing's going to pitch in a certain way, you're going to have couplings between yaw. Yeah, I mean, I think that adding some sort of inertial actuation with a pair of bilaterally symmetrical tails is um, a good idea. Mm -hmm. so All right. Thanks. Yeah, so you mentioned about the escape mechanism. Yeah. So if I'm not wrong, I think escape works with some gear that discretizes the state, uh -huh. so to say. So do you... Do you have similar thing in your model? That well, this creates it's a little more space? general than that. So when I, yeah. when I talk about the escapement, I think you know, you've got a pendulum, and if you need to, it's going to die over time because it's got air friction. You need to push it and keep it going. Mm -hmm. How do you do that without ruining that timekeeping? Well, one way to do it is either to, when it has only a you know, velocity comes to zero, instantaneously move it to a new position and let it go again. It wouldn't change the timing. Or when it's all velocity at the bottom, instantaneously change its velocity, which you can do with an impulse. And so I think escapements have been over time designed to a maximum impulse right at the bottom to try and you know, mess with the pendular dynamics as little as possible. So it's, it's, that's sort of what I mean with the legged locomotion. If you want to create this dynamical phenomenon, it's got a certain spring mass behavior. If you put harmonic drives and gear motors on each joint, you're messing with the dynamics. And when the robot lands on the ground, it's going to have an impact and an inelastic collision. And that ruins the ability to implement that dynamical phenomenon. Uh, you mentioned 60-40 uh, passive dynamics and control. Yeah. And interestingly, in humans, we don't actually know uh, the ratio. And so I'm just wondering, in the robot, when you're producing the M-shaped ground reaction force that's like Christian, mm -hmm. Uh, do you, you probably do know the, uh, the amount of energy you're getting out back from your springs. Maybe we should say it is known. I don't remember. But it is actually the, uh, one of the things we found that was really important. Um, you know, first, we were trying to hold those motors as rigid as possible, and all of that bounce come from the spring. The problem is that the springs have no damping or dissipation, and so if it bounces a little bit off, that energy comes back out, but not in the direction you want it to be. So actually, when we had about 50%-ish of the uh, stiffness in the proportional constant in the motor and 50% in the spring, so the spring, the physical spring is twice as stiff as you want it, and the software spring is twice, you know, and they add up to be the right stiffness, back driving through those uh, gear motors and having dissipation in your software is what made Atrius really robust to lots of disturbances and things. So yeah, something like 50-50. Uh, so th that recalls uh, Sungbae Kim, who uh, his robots looked very uh, mass springish, but actually he was totally opposed to springs because yep. he didn't like the uh, the problems of doing force control through through the springs. Yep. Yep. Okay, challenges. So um, you showed the robot recovering from somewhat discrete vertical perturbations. How does it perform when there's like more continuous uneven terrain in the vertical direction? Well, we also showed it walking around outside. Yeah, but and I don't know how, how much that was because, um, I mean, I, mean I, don't, I don't know how uneven that terrain really was yeah. because there was like grass and the, uh, and the mud path looked pretty flat. Like, yeah. But if you had like a bunch of rocks, would it do well? So, uh, well, I don't know because we took those videos on Friday mm -hmm. and we have a lot of room for improvement. But I will say that with Atreus, when we had it walking over, you know, we threw out a bunch of boards and had it going over randomized terrain. My opinion is that if you wrapped me up in a carpet so I couldn't see anything and couldn't really use my arms and said, I promise the ground is flat in front of you, run, um, Atrius was probably a little better, or at least on par. So I think we can do at least that with the robot. Let's do it. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, Jonathan, you and Art just had a question about passive dynamics and, uh, and um, how much is from active control. It seemed like you both understood and agreed upon how to figure this out, but I'm not clear on, on what this calculation actually is. Like, so what are you doing to, to sort of figure out what so parts I, passive dynamics and what parts? Well, I can answer control? a little bit more to that too. Um, uh, you know, there's other robots that are that do good dynamic stuff. Like, take Sangbae Kim's as an example. Um, he's done some really 
a lot of work to um, minimize the inertia and maximize the torque of the motor, which basically is trying to remove the annoying passive dynamics to get in your way so that you can do almost all of it in software. So okay. he has much more of a software to hardware. Yeah, I don't, but, but it seemed like you guys were willing to, you're saying you could actually have an answer. So that like, there's an answer that's something like 37% passive dynamics. And but, what is that calculation? Maybe you want to try and answer it, that. It, but it, my point is it doesn't, it's an engineering question. If you have actuators that have infinite bandwidth and don't get in the way of your dynamics, then you should do it all in software. If your actuators suck and you have a whole bunch of inertia and other problems with it, then you have to do something passive to overcome those actuator dynamics. That's you're, the only reason. Well, I think you're thinking purely from robot design, but like, let's say you want to understand in human locomotion how much to attribute to passive dynamics and how much to attribute to active control, then there's some calculation you want to perform. And, I'm, and you, it sounds like you have a calculation in mind, and I don't think it's clear to the rest of us what that calculation is. Uh, so it looked like in the structure of your limbs you had a kind of process where that proximal spring attached. It was like displaced from the center of rotation of the joint. Sorry, can you repeat? Yeah, so the um, top spring in your leg looked like it was deliberately displaced, like its attachment point was deliberately displaced from the rotation point of the joint. Does that make sense? Like it had a So yeah, it's a process. leaf spring, so it's a cantilever. Okay, so it's not that you're trying to have a different moment arm for the spring and the actuator no. at the joint? No. I mean, the way, the way it works is that the leg has three links and mm -hmm. two degrees of freedom in mm -hmm. the plane. And so we have a four-bar linkage connecting the thigh to the tarsus at the bottom. And that four-bar linkage is connected with that leaf spring to okay. implement the appliance. Thank you.